So as an educator, you know, we live and breathe research. We, we do all these studies and we just have an amalgamation of knowledge and prior experience to a lot of concepts that may not be widely enough distributed for a company for everybody to know everything, you know what I mean? So like a designer may be siloed or maybe a designer just doesn't have enough experience with just like this breadth of products or just even the departments that come to us to ask for things. And so whenever we are engaging in research, there may have been prior research done that can actually help shed some light to illuminate more about just answering the question that a designer may have. So what that means is as an educator, we're able to essentially provide that context. And so, you know, aside from like the typical best practices, we also like to promote a, a culture that seeks valuable insights into more like the attitudes, perceptions, and behaviors of a company's target audience. And so because we have experience with so many different teams to find these core insights, right? It just it helps give designers, no matter you know which department or whatnot, as well as like product managers too, who you know would be deeply involved in the product itself, as well as executives to be given some sort of clear path forward when it comes to prioritizing actionable items. So then, as a technical executor, we still have to do the work. So rather than just being somebody uh, that can just answer these questions, we still have to dig in our heels in order for us to really come to these sort of research conclusions. And to do that, we got to go to our participants and we got to ask them through like surveys or through interviews to gather a bunch of qualitative and quantitative data. So we select the appropriate research method to essentially secure the inquisitive needs of our stakeholders. And then we can be more of like a technical executor where we execute on a strategy uh, in order to accomplish all this stuff. And so the purpose is to just essentially aid the iterative process so that improvements are well guided by our suggestions. And these suggestions come from a user generated source. So it's like you're able to get user feedback, not just my feedback or someone else's opinion per se. So rather than it's just me saying that we should do this, it's really more of like we are all saying this. But my particular suggestions and whatnot are heavily influenced based off of the user feedback. And this is where it gets to also be somewhat of like, another role, if you will, as a UX researcher, we're really there to be champions for our participants. So it's almost like we are tasked with anywhere from like 10 to 100 or so, depending on you know the, the methods that you use to gather all this information. We hear and we listen and we read everything that people have to say. And that gives us this sort of idea that we can then really effectively demonstrate the empathy portion of ourselves. That, that's a, a really important thing for UX research is to have empathy so that we can essentially champion for them. And so we are essentially the voice of uh, the users when it comes down to these products. And so that has a lot of value for pretty much anybody that's involved within the product development lifecycle. I would say that it is really dependent on sort of like the experience level or just like the level that a researcher is. So let's say you just started off as a UX researcher. You may not have enough experience or just have developed enough of that skill set, let's say, to really be that of an educator because you're kind of still learning. So like a junior researcher will typically focus on more of like the technical execution, much more so than like a senior researcher. However, it's also important to also gauge the level of experience that a team has when it comes to UX research when meeting uh, them for the first time. So, you know, some some just have more experience than others. You know, some just kind of like have dipped their toes into it. Some have maybe their own researcher that's been assigned for a very long time. And, you know, they have this like very intimate relationship with research because of the researcher and there are teams that just have never had ux researchers before so you're just being able to kind of like gauge where the team is so that you can be somebody that can kind of help fulfill their needs a senior researcher would just have a lot better of a job i would say than a junior researcher to kind of essentially adapt to that as you gain more experience then that kind of helps you essentially develop that muscle for you to be a uh, or an educator so the balancing aspect really just comes down to experience and as, as well as initiative. 
And so, for example, democratization of UX research, that's sort of like a standalone endeavor that is independent of our daily responsibilities. And my team is really trying to demonstrate this and to enact this within our company by holding workshops. We have targeted the industrial design team because we work very closely with them in addition to the fact that we've noticed that there's this gap and hopefully by democratizing UX research and enabling them to do research themselves that they're able to essentially gain some level of proficiency to help benefit them. We also have office hours pretty much every day in order to just be there as a support structure so that we can make sure that they are up to date with sort of best practices and whatnot when it comes down to UX research as a whole. That's a good question. And I would like to throw in sort of like a reverse Uno card there in the sense that there's actually more of a challenge for a researcher to go into a completely new environment where the design team and the, the product owners or product managers, the developers, they're already intimately aware of everything that's going on. They're living and breathing this stuff. They're getting to the point where they're talking in circles sometimes. And you're just in here trying to latch on and understand what's going on so that you can essentially assess the situation and then effectively frame and scope the project's sort of research needs, if you will, so that we can launch a study that's digestible for purchases. Let's say you wanted to have like this lawyer software that has all these bells and whistles and very complicated technical jargon and it has specific features for these sort of like technicalities and rather than just giving it to a lawyer and say like hey what do you think about all this stuff it's just more of let's get them to perform a specific task that is going to use this system so that we can break everything down uh, and a participant isn't sort of like wandering aimlessly and then giving, you know, their thoughts about this. It's really just more of like, I tried to do this task and we have been coming up with different ways to kind of perform this task, but we figured it would be best if we explored and investigated this with UX research in order to kind of see if there are any pain points or if there is any room for improvement and so on. So a lot of times when it comes down to like communication, it's really more about just like the boundaries of the project itself. And that way we can provide uh, relevant user feedback so that it actually becomes something that's actionable. So it's really just finding the time to do it. That's really the biggest challenge because when you are a UX researcher, you just live and breathe research. And so being able to find other than like when the time presents itself within a meeting, and then you can then be like, oh, there was previous research that we did that I can tell you about. Like to actually set time for these workshops has been kind of challenging. However, uh, we've been successful in, in essentially launching this, and I think it's been going really well and we've been making significant progress. And so we've been showing them a bunch of UX research materials to get them started and, and help them with creating surveys so that they can essentially do things themselves in the interest of enabling their own role with enhanced capabilities, let's say, by performing research. We essentially create outlines as well as detailed instructions and other supporting documentation to help organize their thoughts. So we'll have one worksheet that asks them important questions that is very similar to a research intake form that we used to have to just get them really thinking about how their particular research request is going to be impactful and valuable as far as the business impact is concerned. So sometimes people will be asking us to do research more for like the sake of doing research to kind of like clue you into just how it can be at some companies uh, is that a product owner may be doing things and will make decisions and then towards the end of it all we'll be like okay now let's do research so that we can kind of like tie uh, everything up with a bow and then send it off we've been pretty much against this from whenever we caught wind that people were doing this and so that's really kind of one of the challenges that we have faced and in response to that have been doing this in order to get people more sort of 
of course, more experience, more exposed, but more so that they feel enabled to handle this kind of research earlier on. And I should also mention that we have been using the LISNA platform in order to demonstrate what we do when, in terms of creating surveys and whatnot. And so as far as just like the detailed instructions, we actually pull screenshots and whatnot from LISNA and talk really in depth about that. The thing that I have learned just from doing this is that people that have never done research compared to people that have lived and breathed research, like there's this huge disparity and it can be extremely overwhelming to them, even though to us as a researcher, it's just like, yeah, that it, it's, it's pretty simple. Like, but it's only because we've been doing this for so long that we have slowly accumulated all of the knowledge that when you eventually dump everything onto other other people, it can be a lot. So you need to make sure that when you are creating all this documentation, you have to keep in mind that you want to be as simple and succinct as possible. All I'm saying is I'm not exactly so sure that they're going to be studying this stuff as if they were studying for like the SATs or like the GREs or something like that. And in fact, they would most likely would rather come and just talk to you about it uh, so that you can work things out. So that's why it's really helpful to have office hours. And that would be, you know, a, a piece of advice that I have. These office hours allow people to essentially feel a lot more assured that they can come to you with questions and there's like a set time. One observation that I have made is that you will most likely want to have your sort of members, let's say, that join in on these workshops to have some form of research that they want to do beforehand as in like hey come to us with something that you could legitimately use for your own projects and we're gonna essentially try to create research around that what you might find is that people just don't have anything pressing enough for them to actually do that so i would say it might be a good idea to come up with some form of example where you can kind of set the stage or set the scenario so people can follow along because they just may not have something sometimes people we have noticed will bring prior research or previously done research in order to kind of like essentially replicate it uh, and so that's something that, as I have observed, might be sort of like a hint that if we were to, let's say, hold this workshop again, maybe you want to create your own sort of scenario so that people can kind of just like follow along. Because there's just no guarantee that there is going to be something that they want to research by the time that you have your workshop.